Hello dear students and welcome back to this history curated revision series. In case you are new over here, then I am Jawad Kazi and I am running this series for history subject revision for prelims 2023. We are taking up high ROI topics so that your revision could be made effective before the Sunday's preliminary examination. In case you are wondering where you could find the links for earlier videos and the PDFs, you can join my telegram channel Jawad Kazi UPSC preparation. You may use this link or scan the QR code given on the screen and join it. With that out of the way, today we are going to discuss a very neglected but high potential topic of personalities. You might have seen in the PYQs that UPSC asks questions related to kings, their courtiers, their contemporaries as well as foreign travelers. Very often these questions come about and since they are quite factual in nature, a lot of students are not able to get them. So here in this lecture, we have compiled all of these facts and we are going to discuss them so that you can retain that in your short term memory before the examination. So let's get started and see some of these important personalities. Okay, now let us see first the famous ruler Chandragupta II who also took the title of Vikramaditya, Gupta ruler and he had a lot of illustrious courtiers in his court. Potentially there can be questions that can be asked, some have already been asked on these personalities. Who all were there? First name over there is Amara Simha who has written Amar Kosh. The word Kosh is a giveaway over here. So this is a compilation or a lexicon of Sanskrit words. He is also a Sanskrit grammarian. Okay? We are going fast in this video so that in less time we can cover as many aspects and details as possible. Second personality is Vishakha Datta who is a famous playwright. He wrote the very very famous play Devi Chandraguptam. This play is basically based on the life of his patron himself. Okay? Now Devi Chandraguptam's story is about how the ruler Chandragupta, he managed to save the honor of that ruling family. His elder brother had lost in the war to an uh, invading Shaka army and in that treaty he was going to surrender his wife to the invader. Chandragupta disguised himself as the queen and went and killed the invader. So the plot of the story is around that and the title is Devi Chandraguptam. Devi was uh, you know a suffix in the name of the queen. Life of Chandragupta the second per based hai hai. Then he also wrote the famous, in fact, even more famous play Mudra Rakshasa. This play is about how Chandragupta Maurya was able to topple down the mighty Nandas and come to power. Then Arya Bhatta is also a contemporary. Arya Bhatta has written Arya Bhatiya and Arya Siddhant. Arya Bhatiya basically deals with Arya Bhatta's ideas about many different types of things primarily in that is of course mathematics but also astronomy and many other areas of his interest and then after that he followed it up with Arya Siddhanta also. So remember the titles as well. Varaha Mihira has written Pancha Siddhantika, Surya Siddhantika and Brihat Samhita. Okay, so Varaha Mihira is also a contemporary it is debatable but some say that he was you know a courtier as well. These are some of the core you can say uh, personalities around the time of Chandragupta the second. The most important one is Kalidas after all of those. Kalidas has written you know multiple uh, genres. So most famous he is most fa famously known for plays. Malavikagni Mitra is a play that he has written. The hero of this play is Shunga King Agnimitra. Pushyamitra Shunga had usurped the throne and his son was Agnimitra. Agnimitra Agnimitra's love story is the subject of this play Malvika Agnimitra. The next one is Vikram Urvashiya. Vikram Urvashiya deals with Vikram and Urvashi. It is said that it is about winning the uh, celestial uh, Apsara Urvashi, the story of that is uh, how the ruler was able to win over Urvashi. Then third and most famous of his plays is of course Abhinyan Shakuntalam which was a very very big hit when it was 
you know, translated into European languages. West Europe really went crazy over this particular play, Abhinayana Shakuntalam, because of the way it captures human emotions. Recognition of Shakuntala. How Shakuntala was forgotten by the king who promised her to get her married and then how she goes through different travels and finally he recognizes her. Anyways, then he has written certain epics which are also called as Mahakavyas in Sanskrit. First amongst them is Raghu Vamsha, which is about the dynasty of the ruler Raghu, who is the ancestor of Lord Ram. So it is about the lineage of Raghu, uh, Raghu Vamsha as the word suggests. Then one more Mahakavya is Kumar Sambhava, which is about the birth of Kumar Kartikeya, who is the first son of Lord Shiva. So these are the epics that Kalidas has written. Then, of course, is the famous Meghaduta and Ritu Samhar, which are written in lyrical forms. So, these are the major creations of Kalidas, who is, you know, associated with that same period of Chandragupta the second. So, I hope you got these facts, guys. Now, next, Kanishka is another important ruler who had very, uh, you know, great luminaries associated with his court. And the most famous amongst them was Ashwa Ghosha. Ashwa Ghosha was a great poet and also master of music. He has written the famous Buddha Charita. Buddha Charita is written in Sanskrit language. He is a scholar of Sanskrit and a Mahayanist. So after Buddha, we have discussed in our earlier lecture that Buddhism gets divided into two sects, Mahayana Buddhism and Hinayana Buddhism. Mahayana Buddhism uses Sanskrit as a medium to convey its thoughts and ideas. Ashwa Ghosha is basically from that school and he is a scholar or an expert of Sanskrit poetry, particularly Kavya style. Okay? He is a Mahasangika, Buddhist philosopher, playwright as well as orator. So he is one important personality that you should remember. There is a lot of chances of questions being asked. Then comes Charaka, who was a great physician, physician of Kanishka. And he has written the famous Charak Samhita, which is based on or which is an important text in Ayurveda. Charak Samhita, remember that. Then next important personality is Vasu Mitra, associated with Kanishka. He was the head of the fourth Buddhist council, which was called during the reign of Kanishka and it was held in Kashmir. So these are personalities associated with Kanishka. Then comes the Chalukyan ruler Pulakesin. His court poet Ravi Kirti, he has written the famous Aihol inscription. This is a very important inscription that talks about the conflict between Pulakesin and Harsha. And in this inscription, we come to know about the victory of Ravi Kirti's patron. So it's a very famous inscription. Remember the author and remember the ruler also. Then Yasho Varman of Kannauj is another famous ruler and we have Bhavabhuti as an important personality in his court. He was known as Throat of Eloquence. This is a root word guys, L-O-Q. L-O-Q is a root word which means to talk and from this L-O-Q is derived eloquence. Okay, The ability to talk very effectively or convey thoughts and ideas very effectively. Okay? In Sanskrit, he is called as Shri Kantha or Throat of Eloquence. So, he is a dramatist of 8th century and he has written the drama Mahavir Charita, Mahavir Charitra, which is basically about the life of Lord Ram. And then subsequently, he has written Uttar Ram Charita, which is a subsequent, you can say, uh, sequel of it. And then Malati Madhava. Malati Madhava is based on a love story written by Bhavabhuti. Okay, so Yashovarman and Bhavabhuti, you have to remember and remember his creations also. Okay, next, Lakshman Sena, the famous Sena ruler. In his court, we had the famous poet Jayadev, whose Gita Govinda is a very important text in the uh, development of Bhakti movement in the eastern part of India. Gita Govinda by Jayadev around the time of Lakshman Sena. Vikramaditya the sixth, he is another famous ruler, western Chalukyas. 
in his court was bilhana who has written the biography of his patron vikramana kadeva charita and vijneshwara who has written mitakshar mitakshar is a treatise on yajnavalkya's law book and this went on to form one of the important law school for india which is widely followed across the country mitakshara law school and the other being daya bhag malik mohammad jaisi is another you can say author or luminary who is a contemporary of sharkis of jaunpur and he is famous for padmavat so these were some of the important rulers and luminaries associated with their courts or their contemporaries okay now we'll see akbar's navratna of course you know all of them quite well but nevertheless the discussion on kings and courtiers can't be completed without a visit to akbar's navratnas the first navratna was abul fazl who was a very close associate of akbar and he has written akbar nama which is largely like a biography of akbar and ain e akbari which gives us very important information regarding the administration governance systems of mughal rule under akbar his brother faizi is another important luminary in his court akbar's court he was a poet known to have composed very beautiful verses in persian abul fazl faizi and their father the three of them had tremendous influence on akbar then comes tan sen about him upsc has already asked a question in recent years mia tan sen was a singer for, uh, singer in akbar's court he was a poet himself also and a student of swami haridas there is a very famous painting of mia tan sen sitting before swami haridas seeking knowledge from him and akbar in the back, background so this is about mia tan sen the tan sen was a title that was given to him by raja man singh of gwalior not akbar this is the question that upsc had asked earlier next important personality is birbal who of course is known for his intelligence and his name was mahesh das birbal was given the title of raja by akbar himself so here's the difference tan sen's title was not given by akbar but raja birbal raja title was given by akbar okay he died fighting the afghan tribes in the northwest around peshawar when there was a rebellion in that area akbar had sent him along with other nobles to suppress that rebellion and unfortunately in the fights that ensued birbal was killed akbar had a lot of grudge uh, about that then next comes the very famous raja todarman raja todarman was the finance minister of akbar he is credited to have organized the revenue department of akbar laid its foundation the ain e dahsala as we have studied in ncert was a brain child of raja todarman and this same system was continued later right up to you know the british times the british also took a lot of cues from this same system and modified it suitably and continued it okay. so raja todarman has given a very Uh, you know important contribution in developing india's administrative system then comes raja man singh the famous kachhawa rajput he is the raja of ambar the kachhawas are uh, uh, you know from amongst the rajput clans one of the rajput clan and they came to accept akbar's suzerainty early during his reign and also had marital relations with him consequently akbar had a lot of fondness for this particular family the family of jaipur later jaipur was founded and that continued right up to the end of mughal times then comes abdul rahim khan e khana he was the son of bairam khan who was bairam khan he was akbar's tutor during his early age and when he was yet not yet ready to take on the responsibility of the state bairam khan was handling the regency okay when akbar came of age he replaced bairam khan and uh, later you know he did not meet a great end but his son continued to have a lot of confidence of akbar then two more navratnas fakir aziz din and mulla dopyaza we need to know their names so these are the navratnas associated with akbar okay now let us see some important 
foreign travelers who came to India over the course of ancient and medieval times. There is an unknown Greek traveler whose name we don't know, of course, but his work is very famous, Periplus of Eritrean Sea. He has written about his travel experiences in this region and that has a lot of you know historical value for a researcher of early ancient times. Then comes Megasthenes. I'm sure you've heard about him. Megasthenes was the ambassador of the Greeks to the court of Chandragupta Maurya. He has written a book or his experiences titled Indica. Okay. Indica, which obviously means India in that language. He had come to Patliputra as ambassador of Seleucus. He writes Chandragupta's name as Sandrocotus because UPSC sometimes does not just ask you names, it also asks you what they have written. So some important facts we need to know. There's a sea of information, we can't remember all of that, but some key facts we need to know. He has written about the use of wood in architecture of Indian homes at that time, especially about a royal palace made of wood. He says that the society was divided into seven classes based on professions. And he also goes on to say that there was no slavery in India. Later on, other writers, Arian, Strabo, Diodorus and Pliny, all of these have referred to his work. Indica was lost later, but these subsequent writers knew about it, had its content and they have referred to Indica. That is how we come to know about his work. Okay, So we don't have an extant source of Indica as such, but then through their writings, we know about it. And there is one more ambassador who comes later. His name is Dimakos. You will come across different spellings in different textbooks, but this is fairly standard. He is also an ambassador from Greece, but he is at the court of Bindusar. Then Ptolemy is another Greek source. Second century AD, he has described the geography of India. The geography of India. Okay. Then come some Chinese travelers about whom we should know and UPSC has asked multiple questions earlier. Fa Yin is one such Chinese traveler who comes around the start of the uh, you know, 5th century during the rule of Chandragupta II. He is basically a Chinese Buddhist monk who wants to learn about Buddhism and read its original sources. So he sets out for India on foot at a very advanced age and via Peshawar he comes to India. Back then Peshawar was called as Purushpur. So he comes to India, visits all the sites associated with Buddhism including Lumbini also which obviously has a lot of sacred relevance. Later on he also went to Sri Lanka because Sri Lanka was a flourishing center of Buddhism with a lot of classical texts. And then he returned to his home via the sea route. So he came on foot but left by sea. He has written his experiences which is titled A Record of Buddhist Kingdoms. So remember the name of this text. Another such scholar was, traveler was Yongshong who comes in the 7th century during the time of Harshavardhana and is you know very well received and honored by the ruler. He has also uh, written his experiences which is titled Buddhist record of the western world. Okay. So remember the two sources over here, Fa Yen and Yong Shong. Then there is one more Chinese traveler who had come to India, Ai Singh, 671 to 695 AD, around that time he is there in India. So these are some of the Chinese travelers. Okay, then comes the famous Al Biruni. Al Biruni comes to India around 1000 AD along with the invading armies of Mahmud Ghaznavi. So he is living in Ghaznavi in, in Ghazni and born in Herat, living in Ghazni and with the invading armies he comes to India and he has a lot of passion for understanding India, its culture, its religion, philosophy, so on and so forth. He was gifted linguist who could speak many languages and after coming to India, he Sanskrit, he studied Sanskrit and also studied Indian philosophy. 
he had become very fond of the ideas given in Upanishads and Gita's Gita. He writes very, very highly about the Indian scholarship and many other aspects of India. His work is titled Kitabal Hind, the book of India. The next traveler that we must know about is Ibn Battuta. He is from Morocco and comes to India around 1333 AD. Now, he is one fantastic guy. He is actually very underrated in history. He has traveled much more, much more widely than the most famous Western traveler Marco Polo. But since he is not from Europe, he is not that well known. So he is as a young man set out from his home in Tangiers, Morocco to perform Hajj. And then after Hajj, he goes on to travel all over the known world at that point. 1333, he comes to India and he is well received by Muhammad bin Tughlaq. Achha, there is one interesting thing he has mentioned about the practice of Sati also. He saw the sight of a lady going Sati and he was so terrified because of it that he got a, uh, you know, panic sort of an attack. He fell from his camel. Anyways, so he comes to Delhi. Muhammad bin Tughlaq made him the Qazi of Delhi. Qazi means the chief judge. He was made Qazi of Delhi and later he sent him as ambassador to China. Okay. On the way, this particular fellow, Ibn Battuta, was looted. All his belongings were taken away and he felt ashamed to go back to Muhammad bin Tughlaq and say or you know narrate his fate. So he never went back to Muhammad bin Tughlaq and started uh, to go back to his home. In all, he has traveled 75,000 miles. That's you know the highest clocked by any traveler of that time. And he traveled not just in Muslim lands, but also in non-Muslim areas. His book is titled Rehla. Rehla means a travel memoir. A travel memoir. Uh, that particular book was written after he went back to his hometown uh, in Morocco. So that is Ibn Battuta. Then the next important traveler is Marco Polo. Marco Polo was from Venice. So he is called as a Venetian. Some sources will also call him as Italian, but at that time there was no Italy as such. So that's why Venetian is a more appropriate term. 1288 to 92, around this period, Marco Polo had come to India. Marco Polo's family was into long distance trading. His father and uncle had come in contact with Kublai Khan of China. Kublai Khan was the grandson of Chinggis Khan and he was ruling over China. Kublai Khan is famous also for his token currency experiment. He had brought paper currency, token currency as such, which later was known by Muhammad bin Tughlaq when he made that infamous experiment. So Kublai Khan became very fond of Marco Polo's family and he asked them to bring some you know christian scriptures as well as some holy water from rome kublai khan was very interested in christianity these people went back and they could not bring all the things that he wanted but nevertheless they brought a young marco polo along so as a teenager itself his journey starts as a traveler he went to china he learned the chinese language mastered it and he was very highly regarded by the Khan himself. So he went on to occupy some very important positions in the Chinese administrative system. On his way back to Venice, you know, after having lived in China for decades, he was going back to his hometown. On his way back, he has come to India and visited the Pandyan Kingdom, South India. Around that time, Rudramma Devi, remember this name? Very important fact, Rudramma Devi of Kakatiya dynasty was ruling in Andhra region and he mentions about her also. He travelled on the Koromandal coast on the east and also visited the Malabar coast and he has left a very detailed account of people, culture, flora, fauna, so on and so forth. So that's Marco Polo for you guys. After Marco Polo, we must know certain travelers who have come to Vijayanagar and the Bahamani kingdoms. So there is a series of these travelers. We need to know briefly about them. Nicolo Conti 
is the first traveler, an Italian who came in 1420 to Cambay and then visited Vijayanagar under Devraya the first. This is the first dynasty of Vijayanagar, very early phase. Niccolo Conti comes at that time and he gives a detailed description of Vijayanagar, the city. He talks about its magnificence, its massive stone walls of how the city was structured and organized, so on and so forth. So a lot of information given there. Very significantly, he called the Telugu language as Italian of the East. Italian of the East. So remember this fact, Niccolo Conti calls it Italian of the East. Later he went to Sri Lanka, Indonesia and Java also. Next travel is Abdur, traveler is Abdul Razak. Abdul Razak was a Persian scholar and he was ambassador of Shah Rukh of the Timurid dynasty. Taimur the Lame, his descendant is Shah Rukh Mirza. So he comes as ambassador of Shah Rukh of this dynasty and he first visits Zamorin of Calicut. He stayed there for a few days and then later went to Vijayanagar where the ruler had invited him. So he goes to Vijayanagar and he also has described Vijayanagar in great detail, the city of Vijayanagar in great detail. He mentioned 300 ports in the kingdom which obviously is an exaggeration, there weren't that many. But he says that there were more than 1 lakh men on the battlefield, that is the army had more than 1 lakh soldiers. He has written a book, Matla us Sadain and Majma ul Bahrain, which described his experiences as a traveler. So just remember the name of the book, Majma ul Bahrain. Bahar in Arabic means ocean. Majma ul Bahrain means joining of two ocean. And Matla means rise. Matla ul Sadain is rise of two stars, and Majma ul Bahrain is joining of two oceans. So these are Arabic words. Okay, a few other travelers, we just need to know where they are from. Nikitin is a Russian traveler who visited the Bahamani states. Nikitin is a Russian traveler. Then comes Domingo Pace who visited Krishna Devraya's court and he has given us a lot of information about Krishna Devraya, his appearance, his lifestyle, his administrative system, uh, his attitudes, many things. Then Barbarossa, he also tells us with, about Krishna Devraya. Nunes is from Portugal and he comes to Vijayanagar after the death of Krishna Devraya. So maybe there might be a question of arranging these people in chronological order or taking some key descriptions that they have given and asking statement based questions. There is always a likelihood of these type of questions. Now in the end let us see some foreign travelers during the Mughal times. During Akbar's time we come across Father Monserrat. He is a Portuguese priest invited by Akbar. Akbar had won Gujarat and after winning Gujarat, he had access to the Arabian Sea. And with access to Arabian Sea came many opportunities of trade but also the challenge of dealing with the Portuguese. So he comes into contact with Portuguese and he wants to understand and know them, their religion etc. etc. That is when he invited some people and Montserrat was part of that delegation. So from Montserrat, he learned about Christian faith. He was impressed by this fellow and he appointed him as prince of his son Murad. This goes to show guys in many ways the uh, level of broad mindedness that Akbar had. At a time when in Europe Bruno was being burnt at stake for challenging the, uh, you know, uh, the ideas that were given in Bible. Akbar is engaging people of other faith. He's talking to Christians, he's talking to Parsis, he's talking to Jews and trying to understand what their faith says with you know, genuine interest and deep respect. He went on to appoint him as the tutor of his son. This goes to show the you know, attitude that he had to, towards people who had different thoughts and beliefs. Then Ralph Fitch is another visitor. British visitor who had come to Akbar's court. So these are two names from Akbar's times that we must know. Then come William Hawkins and Sir Thomas Rowe. Both of them come as ambassadors to the Brit to court of Jahangir and both of them want to win or want to get some rights to establish factories in India. Ultimately Jahangir relents and allows them to set up factory in Surat 
and then later on across the Mughal dominion. So that is William Hawkins and Sir Thomas Rowe. Then comes William Finch, another British traveller at the court of Jahangir. So these three have come during the reign of Jahangir. Then is Peter Mundi. He is a famous English trader who has come during the time of Shah Jahan and he has given a very elaborate description of Banjaras. He happened to see the Banjaras and their way of moving about. He saw a tanda as it is called of Banjaras having more than 14 to 15 thousand livestock and how they were traveling carrying goods. He has given a detailed description of that. The next traveler is Tavernier. UPSC had asked a question on these two guys. Tavernier was a French jeweler who used to trade in diamonds and he, he was buying diamonds from India. Now diamonds from India were exceptionally famous in the world market. There was huge demand for Indian diamonds, especially the Golconda diamonds. He had bought the famous diamond called as the blue diamond, which he sold to Louis XIV, the famous French ruler. Uh, Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb's reign is the period where he has come multiple times to India. Since they are very close to each other, father and son, he has come during both the periods. Six to seven times he has traveled to India. Then another famous traveler or foreigner in India was Bernier. He also was a French man, a physician. He has written a very important first hand source of the Mughal period, especially Aurangzeb's period, titled Travels in the Mughal Empire. Travels in the Mughal Empire. He has described Delhi and Agra in great detail and has also given us tremendous information about the succession wars of Aurangzeb. How Aurangzeb came to the throne, since he is around that period only, he tells us about all the wars that took place and how Aurangzeb finally managed to become the emperor. Then is Menusi. He is a Venetian or Italian. He is a doctor and during Aurangzeb's reign, he has come to India. He first met Dara Shiko, who was, you know, who was defeated but not yet outside of India. He came across Dara Shiko's family and he treated the family and then later on people took him to Aurangzeb where again he was allowed to practice in the imperial capital. He has written his experiences as Storia do Mogor which is again a very important source for understanding history of Mughal period from a western perspective. So these are some of the important names of travelers that we must know and a brief information about what could be asked. I hope you found this lecture useful guys. Many more such lectures are coming up over the course of next two days so that your revision becomes effective and you crack the prelims and write the mains after that. Thank you very much for joining in this session. I'll see you in my next lecture.